Our names are Maria Tomalonis and Kelly Darling, and we're your PTG co-presidents. Uh, we'd like to thank the principals for being here um, and taking the time to be with us today, um, as well as a special thank you to BCTV for uh, recording for us um, for this event. Uh, at this time, we'd like uh, to ask each principal to share some highlights from the 2022-23 school year at your respective schools. Um, just something to look forward to in the last few weeks before the school year comes to an end. So we'll start over on, on your side, Mr. Jazokas. Okie dokie. We'll move on down and then we'll continue with more, some more questions afterwards. Okay. Highlights are we've had a very, very successful school year just overall. Um, the building feels, I think, like all of our buildings, pretty much back to normal. It took a few years to get there, but it's been a very steady and calm and nice year. Uh, we brought some things back, like um, our sister school exchange program we hadn't run those since pre-pandemic so things like that are back looking ahead it's a busy end of the year for us i'm going to go through my list so currently we have ap and ib testing happen we do that at saint elizabeth seton we've had that partnership for about 10 years so that's worked really well it's a nice quiet spot for kids to go to testing that's happening now it goes through almost the end of may Coming up, we have the BHS Theater Company performing Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Mm -hmm. That's next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I think we have shows at 4 and 7, and then a Saturday show at 2 and 7. Tuesday the 16th is Organizations Awards Night. Our organizations are like our big clubs. Um, they compete for us, so First Robotics, DECA, the Theater Company, it's, it's our bigger groups. And so we highlight the achievements of those students in um, the Organization Awards Night. That's coming up on the 18th, sorry, the 16th. The 17th, we have National Honor Society Induction Ceremony. Prom is the following Saturday at the Doubletree in Manchester. The theme is the Roaring Twenties. We sold more tickets than ever, believe it or not. We usually hover just over 600. I think we sold 641. That's a record for the school, actually. And the Taiwanese students will be here at that time, so they're going to experience an, experience an American prom. The PTG generously actually paid for those tickets mm -hmm. for those students to attend, so it's going to be really cool for them. Yeah. They're very excited. Um, looking way ahead, Monday the 22nd of May, uh, we have the Thespian Honor Society induction ceremony. Tuesday the 23rd is the World Language Honor Society induction ceremonies. Thursday the 25th, we start sort of the end of the year stuff. We have an underclassman <coughs> IB Learner Profile <coughs> Awards. We do that annually. And then after that, senior week is right on the heels of that. That starts June 1st with senior celebration days. That's when senior project uh, students present their senior projects and IB diploma students present their CAS and their EE projects. And then we get into graduation and senior week, but I'll save that in case there's another question. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Um, so, Lurgio, I, I think I'd echo the sentiments of Bob that I feel like we're getting back to normal um, and that a lot of the, the fun busyness that we've uh, enjoyed in the past is coming back. We've had uh, great sports seasons. We've had great clubs, activities, concerts, um, musicals. Um, so to have those things returning to Lurgio is kind of a really <coughs> special thing. And I know for many of our students, it's uh, really um, the thing that they'll remember the longest you know, about their experience and their, their time at Lurgio. Um, so it's nice to see all of those great traditions coming back. Um, even some of the, the silly ones, like we do dances, Midnight Madness, uh, movie nights, those kind of fun things that are there for the students are really important to them. Um, at the same time, um, we've had a great academic year as well. Uh, students have been working hard, at least that's what my advisees tell me, that uh, they're sick of homework, but that's okay, it's May. Uh, the end is nigh. Um, so looking forward, though, we've got a lot of uh, fun end-of-the-year things. I, I hate to say it, but once we get back from April break, it almost feels like a sprint into yeah. the end of the year. Um, and we had a great week this week. We had Ed Garrity come in, um, who is a motivational speaker. He's, he's or I should say, an inspirational speaker. Um, he's been our keynote for Stand By Me for, um, for a number of years. So I really wanted, because we didn't have Stand By Me this year, to have the ability to have the students experience him. He's, he's a great speaker. And then he did some work with the kids on creating dream boards uh, thereafter, which was wonderful. Um, actually, last night, if you have a music student, you would have gone to the May the 4th Be With You concert, which was a Star Wars-themed concert, which uh, was a joint between the high school and the middle school. And... Um, you know, it's really just one of those moments where you say it's a pretty special place to be in Bedford when you can see such collaboration and mentorship from uh, the students at the high school to my middle school students um, and to see them pull that off. 
probably not much we wouldn't do for him, including dressing up like Jedis and wielding lightsabers. So um, that was a great evening, um, but more to look forward to. Um, as we get to the end of the year, we have, of course, testing next week. So I'll be putting out my uh, Lurgio news tonight and reminding parents about testing and talking to our students about getting sleep and eating well and, and being ready to show the world what you know. Um, and then as we get into the end of the year, there's a lot of really fun activities that happen. Uh, we will have uh, a spring concert. We will have our, our eighth grade awards night. All of those things will go out in my Lurgio news as we get there. Um, our student council is planning some fun things for the kids at the end of the year. Um, and then we have a field trip that I will announce later this afternoon uh, to all the students. That, so that's coming up uh, very shortly. Um, but end of the year, it, it tends to be uh, a really fast time, but a really fun time for the students. Um, so spirits are pretty high. They've all had a nice week off and a little bit of rest before we kind of power through this last part of the year. So thanks. Um, I'm going to echo what Bob and Ed said. It's been a really wonderful year at McKelvey, much more normal than any year we've had um, for the last few. Uh, a lot of fun activities have happened already. We had bingo night again this year. That was a blast. A lot of families showed up for that. Um, we had Grand Friends Day in April thinking it would be cooler um, than having it in May, and it was still 90 degrees that week, uh, but the grand, we had a ton of Grand Friends. We had well over 500 guests. It was wonderful, um, and thank you to Amy Dion for, for really organizing that. It was fantastic. Um, we have a lot coming up in the spring. It really is a sprint. Um, we brought back the All School Read Project this year. The book we, we read was Restart by Gordon Corman, and Gordon Corman is at McKelvey right now doing assembly for fifth and sixth grade um, and he's a fantastic presenter he does a, a really great job of interacting with the kids and really keeping their attention so that's been fantastic um, we have SAS testing next week and then the spring concert is May 11th and the following week we have the Little Mermaid Junior is our school play it's a huge production Nate Sawyer is doing a fantastic job uh, Rebecca Coughlin is doing a fantastic job and the kids are amazing you know listening to them sing it's been a lot of fun so I'm excited for that production and then we have a, a Memorial Day assembly coming up on the 26th. And for fifth grade, the field trips are coming. We have the estuary and the Museum of Science. And then for sixth grade, it's the end of sixth grade fun trip to Chucksters that the kids really look forward to. Um, so that's also coming up. And the other really big thing that is occurring right now at McKelvey is that transition from fourth grade families to McKelvey. So we've, we've already started reaching out to families. Um, we have a lot of events coming up for kids. The uh, teacher, the, I'm sorry, the administration and guidance counselors, we go to all the elementary schools to talk to the kids, uh, answer their questions, <coughs> show them a video of a day in, in the life of a fifth grader. Um, and we really try to give as many opportunities as we can for families and for students to get into the building to be comfortable for that transition. So I can talk more about that in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I agree completely. Having um, the schools opened up this year, having the, our big events like our spring fling and the different activities that's taking place all year, it's just been great to, to have some normalcy back into our school year. Um, and our kids really look forward to the McKelvey crew coming over. Our fourth graders get so excited mm -hmm. to hear what is it like in McKelvey, and what are the lockers like, and what is it, you know, the school day. So they'll be looking forward to that. We've got lots of things happening. It is a sprint, like Ed said, right to the end of the, the year from this point on. Um, we continue with our SAS testing, uh, like, like McKelvey is, uh, next week. We'll start that with our third and fourth graders. Um, then we have our uh, of course, what our teachers look forward to so much is Teacher Appreciation Week next week. Uh, so thank you, PTG, for that, because um, that is really a highlight of their, of their year. Um, our course concert is coming up on the 18th. Uh, we do our kindergarten orientation um, where we bring our, our next year's kindergarten parents in and kindergartners, and that'll be on the 12th of May. Um, the 18th of May, we do the same thing for our first graders. Then we have Grand Friends Day coming up on the 23rd of May. Um, we have our field day June 5th. Our BHS senior uh, will come and visit our schools. Um, that happens on June 8th. Of course, we do our move up day and our clap out for our fourth graders on the last day of school. So there's just a lot of things that will be happening and just a lot of fun activities as we finish out the year. All right. Thanks, Phil. Okay. At Riddlebrook, yeah, we have some, we've had a great year this year. Um, a lot of positive energy and um, but before I begin, I just really want to say thank you to some parents who have really gone above and beyond to 
help us work everything out this year and we have a lot of volunteers that came in a lot of events which we need to vol volunteers for so Becca Durrell Nicole Peterson and Courtney McHale couldn't have done this year without them so um, a big thank you to them and Kelly and Maria too you guys have been great um, organizing things with us too so we really truly appreciate everybody um, so we just had right before vacation our um, family fun night which was fun and um, we had a lot of people attend and we raised a lot of money so thank you to the to the community for that um, we have SAS testing coming up the 8th through the 24th of this month for third and fourth grade students they've started to um, we say practice but it's not really practice it's to become uh, more familiar with the the computer and how the test runs and things like that versus the content but they're they're in the throes of that right now um, tonight we have our boys choice luau that's happening at our building so that's always fun um, our grand friends day is the ninth next Tuesday I believe is the the date um, and I think we have over 400 uh, people registered already for that and I'm sure it'll grow a little bit so that'll be fun um, our concert our spring concert which will include our two choruses and our strings kids is May 15th and that's at the BHS theater at 630 um, field days are May 30th and 31st and just as um, Phil said I think all three elementary schools have these similar dates so our BHS clap out is June 8th last day for kindergarten June 12th kindergarten graduation June 13th and then our last day move up and fourth day to fourth grade clap out the last day of school so lots going on but a lot of fun fun things happening and um, if the weather gets better the kids will be just a little bit happier it was kind of hard to come back this week with this uh, weather but things are getting better but uh, everyone's in a, in a in a great place and we're really looking forward to the end of the year so thank you hello so um, being a principal and being a parent in Bedford has been just so awesome. So listening to people talk, it's really exciting to me. Um, I was, I got to be in the audience last night during the reenactment of Star Wars, and it was amazing to see all the middle and the high school kids together, and then the adults, the band teachers, the chorus presenters, the kids moving the chairs back and forth. It's just, I guess it's just amazing what we can do in this town, and I appreciate everyone's um, support. Saying that next week is, um, as mentioned before, we have the um, celebration of teacher appreciation. It's Peter Woodbury's 50th anniversary this year, so it's been really exciting. Um, we've been celebrating the past, present, and the future, and that's what we're going to be doing next week. That's our theme. So we're going to start off with 70s candy on Monday, and the teachers are just going to love that. So big shout out to Meg um, Duhame and Andy Robinson for all the efforts to make um, Peter Woodbury the place that it is. So some dates that are coming out. Also, we have our art show um, and our strings concert and our chorus concert on May 10th. Grandparent, Grand Friends Day, May 16th, Boys Night Out on May 19th, May 24th, Kindergarten Orientation, and then First Grade Orientation on May 31st. Um, also, our field day is on June 5th. Um, June 8th, we have a fourth grade egg drop, which is a big deal at Peter Woodbury. The fire trucks come, and they love getting up on the ladder. The firefighters have the most fun out of it, all of it. They just are so funny because they have to go on the ladder, and the eggs that make it in their containers, they get to go all the way up on the ladder and drop them. So it's, it's a good day. It's the same day as BHS clap out, and then kindergarten graduation, like everyone said, the 13th, and then the clap out on the 14th move up day. So that's what's coming up. So uh, you touched a little bit about this, Bob, but we just uh, want, uh, were wondering if you could discuss in a little more detail graduation and any of the other senior events that are coming up. Sure. I'll, I'll work backwards from graduation. So yeah. graduation is on the 10th at 10 o'clock as usual, outdoors, hopefully, if it's not raining. Um, I'll give people a heads up the day before if we have to move it indoors. We'll see. Who knows, right? <laughs> hopefully it'll be outdoors because it's such a great, great if you've been there. It's just, just awesome to be outside and have everyone out there in the stands and on the field. Um, prior to that is Senior Week. Senior Week kicks off with Senior Celebration Days, those two days where senior projects happen and uh, IB Diplomas kids present. And then and, um, parents and families will be invited to those. So I think n at the end of next week, students will know their presentation times and so then they'll be able to give out their invitations to have folks come to the school to watch those so that'll be happening soon within the next week or so so then those two presentation days happen and then senior week begins um, 
the real business business of senior week is graduation <laughs> practice. So the kids come for four different practices, um, so they're ready for that day. And then there's some fun things that happen, like the clapouts at the elementary schools. The seniors are planning a barbecue as usual, maybe a midnight madness. Um, I haven't seen their final schedule yet, um, but it's everything that I've just talked about in a little bit more is on the school website. There's a class of 2023 tab at the beginning, at the top of the main page. And if you click there, all the information is there, stuff about graduation and senior week, and it's information for um, parents and the students. And then once the seniors make some final um, choices about the fun stuff they're doing, that'll go on there too. It's going to be fun. It always is. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So uh, the next question, I guess we can kind of, it's for sort of everybody, um, but maybe a little more applicable to the older grades. Um, this was a question that was submitted to us by a parent. Um, with illegal drugs and substances on the rise in America, has the approach within the schools changed over the last years specifically to make students and parents aware, aware of what is out in the world and what to look for? Most parents were raised during the height of D.A.R.E. Um, is there any discussion of this in the upper grades or in the lower grades? Um, and what is the communication in our town between resource officers and the school regarding what is seen in the community? You know, we're aware of um, programs like Be Bold, um, but w is there any connection with the schools on, on those programs, and, and how does that happen within the schools? I'll start. You can jump yeah. in. Yeah, that sounds okay. good. Um, there's a lot of layers in that question. So, <laughs> so <laughs> drug use and alcohol use is still an issue for sure, right? If you've looked at the Youth Risk Behavior Survey results, um, some things that are still present and our kids are using, um, Alcohol, marijuana, vaping, nicotine, and marijuana are sort of um, very present. Kids still report to us that they're using prescription pain medication. They still report that they're using some things like ecstasy and heroin, and so um, some pretty serious things. I think um, there's been a lot of dialogue between schools with Be Bold, uh, with the superintendent, um, with the, the health curriculum. I mean, a lot is done in my wellness curriculum, and that starts before I even get the students. Um, so we're very aware of that's going on. I think we can do a better job of informing parents. Like, when I, when I, saw, I saw this question earlier, right? And so it got me thinking. I'm a parent at home, but I don't – we've done some work with what vaping looks like, but I think – um, the, the most dangerous thing right now that we hear from the SROs, because we work very closely with the police, uh, are street pressed what look like prescription medication, but they have fentanyl in them. Mm -hmm. um, you've probably seen that in the news. Um, we should share what that looks like, those, those actual pills look like to parents. That's a great idea, because um, that's, I think, the most dangerous thing our students are facing right now. Um, but it's always on our mind. We, we have monthly and sometimes more than that uh, meetings about how to address this um, our school counselors and our wellness teachers do a lot of work in this area we plan to do some more work at the summer curriculum institute um, just to get after the trends we're seeing in the youth risk behavior survey so we can stay up to date with what our kids are experiencing yeah i'd, I'd agree i think the um it's ever changing um which is you know that's the the scarier part that, um, yes, there are, you know, substances that kids have, you know, abused or used since we were kids. Um, you know, when you think about like marijuana or nicotine or alcohol, um, but there is always some more creative way that, um, you know, people are trying to reach our students uh, with that. And so um, we, it is a never ending battle to understand what's going on. Uh, we do get a lot of information from our SROs. Um, I think we get information from kids too, um, and that's the idea of that you want to have those opportunities for kids to be talking to adults as to what's really going on in the community, um, and then what you know, it, it, you know, substance abuse and healthy choices is an integral part of our health curriculums. Um, it's in you know things that come up even during our advisories. Um, that said, um, I agree. You know how we reach out to parents to help them understand, or how they can help us know what's going on, because um, we have parents that this is a great community. We have parents that are working in either law enforcement, they're working in the health fields, they're they're seeing things as well. So it is something that when we talk about like be bold, their lane is the community, and um, and that's a very important source and a place that they do a really good job of connecting with the community as well. So. Um, knowing where we're all trying to, you know, address a major issue that seems to just be there for us. Um, and I think, and trying to stay one step ahead of it and keep our kids as safe as possible. 
And I think the bigger thing that it comes down to is educating our kids. Um, that's our, our most powerful <laughs> weapon is the knowledge that we can give them. Um, and then that open line of communication for them to be able to talk about that. And uh, same at McKelvey, we in our health curriculum spend time um, talking to our kids about the dangers of drug use, vaping, smoking, nicotine, those products. Um, but we also spend a lot of time working with kids on peer pressure and different ways to deal with pre peer pressure and how to get yourself out of certain situations. Um, and also building positive relationships with people who are healthy relationships for you and making those positive choices. Um, in the past, if we are aware of one or two students at McKelvey that have been vaping, um, and it has been years since we're aware of that, but when we know of one or two kids, then I have to assume there's probably more that we don't know about. And when those situations happen, we do inform families. Um, in the past, we've shown families what vaping tools look like because it looks like something you just plug into your, into your computer or into your charger, not like something you would expect to see, I guess. They're, they're very easy to disguise. Um, so when those situations happen, we do reach out to families. Um, fortunately, it's been a number of years since we've had any vaping at McKelvey that I'm aware of, um, but it is something that we work on with our kids right through fifth grade, fifth and sixth grade. Well, yeah, ours are more kind of, we don't talk about drugs necessarily specifically with the kids, but we talk about healthy choices. We have classroom guidance lessons um, that, our, that our, our school counselor goes in and talks about. Um, being able to protect your body and, and so and and uh, positive friendships, positive relationships, all those kind of big picture issues that I think are maybe the prelude to making better choices when they um, go up in the grades. So, yeah. also we have, we have fit kids that comes in. We um, they come in at six weeks. I'm not, not yeah. even sure. Yeah. They come for yeah. about six weeks to work with our fourth graders. Just about and they do yeah. talk about uh, nicotine and smoking okay. yeah. and. You know, again, healthy lifestyles and choices uh, to really get that started to have kids thinking about, you know, healthy lifestyles, basically. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think at the elementary, the most important thing, and Molly touched on it, is building positive relationships and knowing when, you know, a peer is doing something that is not okay. If you're there with them, even though you might be doing it, you're part of something, and it's about your reputation and respect. And really, they're at that age where they're so influential that the more we can teach them that's so when they get older, they don't, um, they don't, um, succumb to peer pressure, the better, right? And the these are the kids the that Ed was saying earlier, are sharing, you know, what they're seeing as well, the right. deal of trust in them. Exactly. I think one thing that's actually really important when we're talking about how we're trying to address this is that when you look at what the consequence of this is, when we do find students that may have that, there's a, oftentimes people think, oh yeah, just hit, hit, them, hit them with the stick, give them a consequence. Mm -hmm. There's always a consequence and every decision has a consequence. Mm -hmm. However, we're educators. So our mission is for that student to know better, to mm -hmm. understand what they've done, how it's impacted people, how it's impacted themselves, and then help them to make better choices in the future. And that is the most effective way for us to work with kids. And so um, it's a combination of things, you know, I think that, and that always address it, but your lower rates or your true change that's gonna happen is when you can connect with kids and have them understand truly the impact of their actions. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we just, this is again for everyone, um, we just want to get an update on how the new visitor system has been working at all the schools. It works great. I mean, honestly, so long as parents bring their driver's license, I think that's the <laughs> biggest thing to remember. Um, but we transitioned to having students check in if they're tardy and whatnot, and it really has been working quite well. Yeah, so far so good think, uh, for us. So we, we, good. We've worked out some of the systems because yeah. anytime you put something new in, what does it look like? How does it interface with uh, Power School to know like our kids when they're checking in and out? Um, so it's really been efficient for us. Mm -hmm. It's been trickier for me for the students because I have a lot of students who have late arrival, midday release, early release. Um, so it's slowed down those students who are coming in. We've done a couple things. Um, just to try to speed that up and make it more efficient, but I, I think we'll have a different system. We'll still be using uh, Identikid, um, but a different way of using it at the high school next year. We're going to learn a lot this spring, I think. Yeah. But parents have been great. Yeah. 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 I think we're all, we, we, we're going to meet in over the summer, the three of us, just to mm -hmm. kind of fine tune it. Yeah. The parents won't know any different. We'll know, you know how we record the data and what we're doing, but so far, so yeah. good. Yeah, I yeah. Agree. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so in the last year, um, the school board has put 
uh, has supported this new communication flow. Um, we just would like to check in and see, you know, how that's going and how you guys are seeing things working on your end. Does it seem like things are smoother in terms of parents reaching out to, you know, appropriate people instead of sort of everything coming through, you know, the principal's desk? Not that you guys necessarily mind yeah. that, but like, you know, has it made it easier for people to receive information in your eyes, you know? I'll, that can, I, can I start? I'll just start at the elementary level, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's right. um, so it's kind of, uh, I was thinking of talking about this anyway, but um, so there's the communication flow, and I think we all have it at the top of our principal notes, which leads me to the next thing that I want to talk about a little bit. I, I, probably more so for you guys, because there's a lot of flows that happen at the upper grades. Um, I would say, to be honest, no. I still get a lot of questions. They just come through, and that's fine. I don't, I don't mind. Um, but it leads me to, when I was talking to other principals about Parent Square, um, and we're really seeing that parents aren't mm -hmm. reading it. So the last, I will say, it's been a big change the last couple of years, few years, that um, teachers have mentioned it to me and that I've seen it as well personally, that things that are in our notes on our website, in teacher notes as well, they're just not getting read. And then the consequence is, um, the biggest consequence is students are missing out sometimes on things and it's heartbreaking to the teachers. The other consequences are it, it's, it's additional work for the front office, for us, for the teachers be, because there are things that we have to do kind of last minute because parents didn't realize that it was um, something that was going on or they needed to send something in or, or whatnot. Um, so my biggest plea, and I, hopefully I'm not alone, I don't know, we've yeah, talked we've about it, uh, is please, I know it's a lot of information, but it's so important um, that you read it at some point. Um, and I know that all of our notes are archived every week, they're archived. So if you're not reading them in your email, you can go back on the web page and read them. But it's just really important that parents read the notes. And, and also, there's a lot of information on our websites that before you maybe reach out about something, just maybe take a look and see if you can find it there. So that's my plea. So I don't mind answering the questions that come in up, that should go to Mr. Munsey or the, what, it's fine, at the elementary level, there's l less going on. But um, I, my biggest plea is to please, please, please read our notes and the teacher's notes as well. Mm -hmm. And I think my hope is that maybe it's gotten better at the SAU for the questions because, and let them come to the building level because we can answer the questions yeah. at the building level. That's, that's fine. And so those are still coming in. I'm just, you know, rather than going to the superintendent's office and then coming to us after, I think more people are coming to us. So that part's probably good. Yeah. Um, but I just echo the, those principal notes that we send. That is our main uh, avenue for communicating to our families so I encourage everyone um, just check them out you know especially the dates you know that they're, they're I put mine right at the top so they know people know what's coming and so they don't have to you know call the check so very good thank you okay this is uh, specific for Riddlebrook um, if you just want to give an update on yeah. the basketball court construction yeah so um as part of um, the organization called Charlie's Team, which is um, in honor of Charlie Zink, who's a former Riddlebrook student that passed away a couple of years ago, in his love of basketball, well, that organization, his family, um, they will be and are building, reviving basketball courts around the community, not just even Bedford, but their plans, I think, go outside of the community. So if you've been to Riddlebrook in the last week, you'll see that our basketball court, our playground, is completely torn up because they're starting the process. So it's all fenced off at this point, um, and they're going to be working on it all summer. Uh, so it, it's, it's, quite a, um, it's quite a project, and it'll be ready for school next year. And I don't know if they can – I have – all I have is this little – picture of it but there's a, this is a rendering uh, I don't know if they can see but anyway um, it's beautiful we're gonna have some uh, seating um, the court itself is pretty high grade um, what else uh, some stairs coming down they're gonna grade it a little bit um, it's really it's gonna be a, a beautiful a beautiful place and obviously we want our kids to use it but the community to use it as well so we are really indebted to the zinc family and to that organization for thinking of us first and uh, giving us that opportunity to also share Charlie's love of athletics and basketball specifically. So anyway, it's coming along and uh, just keep a lookout for it. Well, thank you. Yeah.
Uh, so the next question is for Lurgio. Uh, they're just looking for an update on the future of Stand By Me and an update on the Breakfast with Guidance event. Sure. Um, why don't I start with guidance because okay. that's a quick update and then I, I really appreciate the ability to talk about Stand By Me. Um, Breakfast with Guidance is something that our guidance counselors have been doing throughout the year. They do three to four different events where they tackle different topics and they invite parents in to come in, have coffee, and join with them. And it's been a great success. Over the past two years, I think we've reached you know 80 or so different parents who have come in. They're small groups, maybe like 10 parents with our counselors, but um, we're getting a variety of parents, which is kind of the objective, just in um, you know uh, different topics will appeal to different people. Um, our guidance team's been very pleased with the turnout and they're gonna continue it in the future. And so we will come down at times if it's more relevant to administration, we always say hello, welcome people, but um, it's been a really great success this year and, uh, and something that we, I think will continue in the future. Um, the other question was regarding uh, Stand By Me. And so uh, Stand By Me, for those of you that don't know, was something that happened um, for over 20 years prior to uh, the pandemic happening when we had to cancel it. And so what the day is, is a day of workshops and, and uh, events that are for both students and parents to attend. We would typically leave campus. We would go to the uh, SNHU campus um, over in Manchester, and we would have a number of different speakers. Ed Garrity, who I mentioned prior, that was actually co-sponsored by PTG and uh, the Stand By Me Committee this year to give our students in seventh grade an experience, um, has been our keynote speaker there for you know as long as I've done that program. Um, that said, it's a it's basically a workshop for many many people, almost you know over 600, maybe closer to 700 parents and students. So it's a very big undertaking. Those who work in the private sector, if you ever planned a conference, it's not a small task. Um, did some uh, we kind of surveyed and wanted to see how parents were feeling about bringing Stand By Me back now that we are kind of past the pandemic, we can get together again. Um, had some very positive feedback from people who have run the program before. Those are some of the people who've coordinated it. We came out, we met um, few new people, but honestly, if this program is gonna continue, I'm putting a plea out to the community. We need people that will step up into leadership roles on this because it is such a big undertaking in order to have it go forward. So this is actually the first stop on my uh, recruitment tour for Stand By Me volunteers. Um, and so uh, I also will speak, be speaking about this when we welcome our sixth grade parents up to Lurgio as well. Um, we have had unbelievable volunteers and chairs of that program in the past problem is they don't have kids going through the program anymore and so we really need to appeal to the younger grades to try to get that out. Uh, Jen was great about allowing me to kind of plug and recruit from McKelvey um, but now I'm actually recruiting uh, district-wide. If people believe in this program you can learn even more about it by clicking on our website. You can see past brochures, you can see the speakers. Many of them are teachers in the community. Many are uh, other reputable speakers that talk about how we raise healthy <coughs> kids. Uh, going forward, we've had the police involved. Uh, police has come in and been, been speakers on keeping our kids safe. <coughs> and so it's been a great event, uh, but we are hanging in the balance right now. So um, if you're out there in TV land and want to get involved with a really good committee and do some great work, make a difference, uh, Stand Be By Me might be for you. So uh, I am recruiting shamelessly. We will be setting a date in the future past, you know, maybe towards the end of May when we're going to see who we've found that can be part of this to see if we can continue forward. So thank you for the opportunity to speak about that. Thank you. All right, Bob, this is a question for you. If you could just provide us with an with a intercession update. Oh, sure. Um, so if you don't know what intercession is, intercession takes place the two days before <coughs> April break. It's, um, it's a lot like Cardigan in that it's an experiential uh, education experience. So there's all kinds of activities, everything from local community service <coughs> all the way to we ran a trip to Costa Rica. All kinds of things. I think we ran about 50 different activities this year. The majority of those happened at school. And like I said before about the culture and climate in the building, the vibe for intercession was just outstanding this year. I, I mean, it was... Just really, really cool. So much good stuff going on. The kids were enthusiastic about it. Everyone was really engaged. Just really good. Um, ten of our programs ran sort of um, overnights and into April vacation, so there's some extended trips and that kids can go on. Um, and all those were successful. There's a um, page. I'll share this in 
this afternoon's VHS News, um, there's a page on the website that has pictures from all the different activities and two videos there. So just even if your kids are in elementary school, just check it out because it's something really cool to look forward to. Great, thank you. Uh, so our final question is um, for mostly the elementary schools. Um, <coughs> if you could just touch on uh, classroom, the classroom placement process for students, um, as well as maybe how enrollment drives that, and um, how how do your numbers in terms of K and first grade look so far? If you if you know. All right. <laughs> you okay, Molly? Let me, I'm going to give Molly <laughs> <Go> a second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. With, <laughs> I'll let her talk about kind of the placement procedures, but as far as the numbers go um, in enrollment, that's really what drives uh, our, our, our teachers um, as far as numbers. So currently, like uh, for instance, we have about 50 kids registered for kindergarten going into next year. That gives us three <laughs> sessions of kindergarten. Um, that number can grow over the summer. If it grows high enough, then we'll get out a fourth <coughs> session of kindergarten. Um, so it works like like that. We we in Bedford we use at the elementary level twenty is kind of the number that we use uh, is our kind of magic number for enrollment. And but we say plus or minus three from there. So if you have a, anywhere from seventeen to twenty three, you can keep it in a class. If it gets to like twenty four, then we start looking at adding a teacher to that grade level. And that's sort of how the enrollment drives. Uh, the number of positions that we have, and we go from there. But do you want to talk a little I bit about try. placement? I mean, sorry. If not, we'll it's jump okay. in. I'm sorry. Yeah, so bottom line is a lot goes into placement, and I know parents don't realize that, And um, but there are like 12 things that we consider when we place kids, and it, it's kind of a long process, too, so you probably... I'm assuming you guys sent out your placement. Yeah, yes. we did. Uh, yeah. So all three of us it was sent in our, out. It was in our notes. In our, uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Um, uh, we, you know, asked parents just if there's anything that we don't know that you, because things happen in neighborhoods, right? Or it's just things that we might not know that we have to keep stu stu uh, certain students away from one another or whatever. So we asked parents um, to, to give us information we might not have. And then we also ask our teachers. So they get these, what we call placement cards. And they kind of um, give us information about all the individual students. And that's happening soon, I believe, as well. <clears throat> and then our placement team, we, um, we meet with our special educators, and they, place, they group the, those students into instructional groups. So like, there might be three kids who struggle with the same thing or, or are learning in the same way. We like to place them together. So we meet with our special ed teachers. And at Riddlebrook, we have intensive needs, and we have our NEC program. So we meet with those teachers, too, and talk about placing those um, students. And then um, just some other considerations. Um, math support and reading support. So we have kiddos that receive those services as well. We have students that have allergies. And <clears throat> sometimes it's safer. I know it's not always convenient, but it's safer to um, place some kids with like allergies together. So if it is a milk-free classroom or a nut-free classroom, it's just that one or two classrooms um, it's just, and, and I, I understand from parents sometimes they feel like it might be an inconvenience, but it really is the safest thing to do for our kids. Um, <clears throat> above all, we place um, kids, heter we have heterogeneous grouping, so we try to spread out um, kids. We have kids at all levels in our classrooms. We have instructional groups. We consider teaching style, peer groups and compatibility, um, behavior concerns, um, social-emotional concerns. Time concerns, so, so because of those things, they take time from teachers, and so we'd have to spread that out a little bit. And then <clears throat> we call it peer inclusion and exclusion. And um, some kids are better together, and some kids are not better together, and we consider all those things too. So that is, um, that is what goes into it, and it, I always describe it as a house of cards because it really truly is, and we pull one card out, things crumble because a lot of times, parents will say, well, I want my child with this person or this group of kids or not with that group of kids. But what you don't understand is one of those kids has this special program and needs to be in that classroom and not that classroom. Or sometimes this is awkward. A par another parent will call and say, I don't want my child. Mm -hmm. So that's why we really, it's, we're not trying to be mean and say we don't take right. teacher requests, <coughs> but there's so much that goes into it that parents don't understand. And we are truly trying to place kids in the best place that we can put them for a variety of reasons, and so, yeah, lots, lots go, lots goes into placement, and um, we're starting the process now. It takes a long time to do, 
uh, K through four. And then we also share um, fourth grade into fifth grade information with McKelvey. They are nice to give us a spreadsheet and we just plug in anything the parents have told us and then they take it from there. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, I think you had asked about KN1 registration numbers for next year. Our numbers are kind of high. So uh, right now in kindergarten, we have 71 students registered for next year, 51 for K+. Um, last year, just in comparison, we had um, 64 registered. So we're up a little bit. And first grade, we have 105 kids registered. Last year, we had 85 at this time. At this time, I look we we have a week by week um, tally that we keep on new registrations, so we're we're getting up there. So, which is good. Job security for us. We're happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And just for Peter Woodbury, we're actually low in kindergarten right now. We're at 42, which is very very low. Um, last year at this time we were at 67, and our first grade is pretty even. We were uh, at 82, 83 last year, and we're at 82. So our first grade is pretty stable, but our K is low. But it could come up. Right. It's just a little early still. Yeah. Though. Can I just add to that? So um, all of the considerations Molly mentioned for placement, we take into account at McKelvey, sorry, McKelvey as well. Um, but placement at McKelvey occurs over the summer versus by the last day of school. Mm -hmm. um, we have anywhere from 20 to 50 plus kids often join McKelvey over the summer. I think it's a great time for students who maybe have been homeschooled um, in charter schools or <laughs> private schools to come back to public school at McKelvey because it's when all of the three elementaries are coming together. Um, so given the number of move-ins we have over the summer, placement occurs over the summer and we notify families around August 10th or so. Yeah, so it gets more and more complicated as you get as far as the curriculum goes. So, what's happening when you get to Lurgio is that um, it's one of the big times when parents make choices as to what math, level of math they'll take, or if they will take a world language, if they'll take a, an academic support class. So there's uh, there's quite a few choices that are going. So we too wait until the summer, and because we're about the same size as McKelvey we do see a lot of influx of, uh, of families coming in and then leaving. Um, so um, we create a much better product by going over the summer to um, make sure we get the kids in the right place. We also have a really nice appeal process when we do the placement process for mathematics. We really want to get kids into the right place, and it's one of the first major choices that uh, parents make in the district as to where their child should be. Um, the wonderful teachers at McKelvey really know the kids. They make non-binding recommendations. So if, what that means is if a parent wants to go through a process and make sure they understand exactly what that pathway is, we will honor that, that change and request. They can go up a level. Um, it's just that we, always, we want to do our due diligence to make sure that the parents understand why this recommendation was made, what the curriculum is going to be, and then what the future consequences of that are going to be as they go through the high school. So um, it really helps us do a much better job of getting all the kids into the, mostly the right place. Nothing's perfect uh, with our, our system, and it's one of those things that we actually, we actually have students that move math level even in September. So we have other kind of redundancies of how we want to make sure that uh, our kids are where they're at. Um, and they're getting to be appropriately challenged. I think that's really the, the, what we're, we're zoning in on. We have two evenings that talk about this. Um, one for eighth grade parents moving up. I'm not even going to try to encapsulate all the information that happens there. <laughs> and then for all um, families and students, every late January before sign-ups, we have an evening just to recap um, how the sign-up process goes and all the different pathways through the school. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, so we did just want to thank you all for coming and taking the time out of your day to chat with us and for BCTV for filming and the PTG would just like to remind everyone that our own spring event is coming up. The Color Blast Fun Run is coming on June 4th. Registration closes on May 31st. So uh, if you check the principal notes, there is information on this as well. <laughs> just another plug for them. For early, for early um if you want reduced pricing, you should sign up by today. Yes, that ends today. <laughs> um, and you can visit our website at bedfordptg.org for more information on this event and about the PTG. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank no, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.